Hello, my name is Paula Fiskel, and welcome to the show. We are beginning a series to honor educational leaders in the Bay Area. This beginning of this week, we will be having guests that come from the educational academia world to share with us some of their steps and, and obstacles and benefits of being in this industry. Today, we have a guest by the name of Loretta Torres, and Ms. Torres has been a past president of LATA, which is Latin American Teachers Association. Ms. Torres has been teaching for 18 years at the Unified School District here in San Francisco. She has also, previous to her being a teacher, she was in the dental industry. And so we welcome Ms. Torres and we recognize that she has accomplished many, many exciting things in the educational world where she influences our children. So welcome. Thank you, Paula. Thank you for having me. I'm very honored to be here today to represent a Latina leader in um, the San Francisco Bay Area. And we are very proud to have you. So I want to start out first by you telling us a little bit about your background, where you came from, and, and how you ended up in San Francisco. I understand you're also a native. Yes, I am a very proud native of San Francisco. I was born and raised in the 50s in San Francisco. Uh, my parents are from Salvadoran and Mexican descent. My father was from Acapulco. My mother was from El Salvador, and that afforded me the beauty of becoming a bilingual and bicultural um, person, citizen as I am, and bilingual teacher. Well, can you explain to our viewers a little bit about the difference between the bilingual education, the dual immersion, and the English as a second language. Oh, I'm happy to. For the last 18 years, um, education in the bilingual realm has been, we've been trying to figure out what to do, what to do with um, bilingual education. We want our students to be bilingual, biliterate, and bicultural. I am a product of that, um, f of that um, experience. What, we, what, what I've done is I've taught in bilingual. Bilingual education is generally a self-contained classroom where a teacher is teaching primarily to one language speaking children. For example, in my case, it's been Spanish speaking children and they learn to read and write in their primary language, which we'll call language one or L1 or primary language. In dual, and they all are pretty much what I call monolingual Spanish speakers. And we build their um, skills and concepts in their primary language. Um, the dual immersion, Spanish dual immersion, or any dual immersion program is generally consists of 50% of one Spanish or whatever L1 primary language. And then they're also, the other half of the students are non whatever L1 that primary language is. In my case, it's been Spanish um, and dual immersion. And it's just been a very um, wonderful experience to have both. I am a huge proponent of dual immersion, dual Spanish immersion. Why that is, is because it breaks barriers for the students. They are learning, both students are learning a second language um, in the process. So that's a little bit different than English as a second language. English as a second second language, what we call what we historically called it English as a second language is more English language development. We are trying to develop the English language. And we've changed from ESL, which is English as a second language, to ELD, English language development, because language is always being developed. Excellent definition. And so you also uh, Tell me that you are part Mexican and part Salvadorian on your mother's and father's side, yes. and that you went to El Salvador to learn how to speak Spanish, and you were actually enrolled in summer school every summer. That's right. Can you tell us about your experiences so, with that? Um, I absolutely uh, encourage my parents of my classroom in my classroom to have to send their students to their country of origin. Why? Because it afforded me such an, a wonderful experience. I, to this day, have friends that I made in El Salvador 
um, and keep in touch with them through Facebook. I've traveled back. It feels like a connection. Those stories my mother told me of her home country, El Salvador, are things that I can relate with and understand. And that also helps me understand my parents when they say, oh, soy del Salvador. And I say, oh, yes, I've been there. And we talk about the parts of the country. And it's uh, it's one way to bridge the, the gaps between people born in this country and the uh, immigrants. Oh, absolutely. I agree entirely. So does that mean then that you also stayed and went to summer school in Acapulco? You know, my father came to this country back in the early 1900s. He was born in... Uh, uh, he was, he's an older uh, father, so he came to this country a lot, um, very young, and he never really got a chance to go back to Acapulco. But later, after he passed, I visited Acapulco. I didn't do um, as much visiting in Mexico because his family basically was um, gone from the country. Wonderful, wonderful. Now, let me ask you a little bit about uh, your work at the Bay Area Writers Guild. Or? Oh, yes. I'm a Bay Area... Uh, Bay, it's, we call it BOP. The Bay Area, Bay Area Writing Writers. Bay Area Writing Project is based out of Berkeley, and uh, every summer they have an institute, a six-week-long institute that takes teachers from the classroom, and they show how they teach writing to students. And what happens is we become teacher consultants after that, and we go back and give um, professional development to other teachers. In other words, it's teachers teaching teachers how to improve the craft of writing and to learn the love of writing. And do you have, uh, just as, as a matter of moving right along on the topic of education, do you have your own opinion on the standardization of tests? Well, that's interesting. You should ask that question. Um, we just got over the standardized testing, and as if you know, right now we're doing computerized testing, which is in, improving in, in, in terms of technology. Historically, we're done, we were tested, we tested in paper and pencil, and standards didn't match the test and what we were teaching. With the new Common Core standards, the way that the testing is, the standardized testing, is that students are able to think critically and express their thinking about reading and writing. Is it Am I all for teaching to the test? I'm all for teaching to the standards, and I'm all for um, accountability. How are the students progressing? How are they doing after a year long of teaching the standards of actually the grade level standards? So, is there or will there be a chance to reevaluate, to change the test? Because for many, many years, as you recall, uh, we were learning without our culture being part of our learning process. And so there was always this identification that we were not considered as smart, not considered as, as potentially leadership quality because we had a different culture. The test is the, so I wanna go back to the question of standardized testing. Am I a proponent of standardized testing? I am a proponent of accountability. Standardized testing, if it's a money maker, if it's um, a way to track students, if it's a way to penalize teachers, I am against it completely. I am for finding a way to assess student learning, all students. Now, in terms of that question around students and our Latinos, how is it biased? Is it, is it a test that is fair for our Latino students? I think if we use the standards to teach our students, and the standards are, the common core around uh, learning to read and write and think critically, learning to analyze what you're seeing, learning to explain your thinking. In our days, Paula, it was, you know, show me the answer, you know, pick the answer, and we don't have to prove the work. Now we're asking students to really show what they understood about reading and writing as well as math. And we have uh, one of the other producers here has uh, spoken about that math. She said she can no longer help her grandson. What is the story on that? That is a struggle. I, it was really hard. To, this year was our first year re moving away from a, a, cur a curriculum, a linear curriculum that we could open a book, you know, read the teacher lesson plans and sort of go standard by standard. Same standards. But now, this year, they have San Francisco Unified created teacher-made um, 
teacher made curriculum and and it really debunks just doing uh, pay, um, algorithms you know what's the answer solve that division solve that multiplication it's more about read that problem what do you think what's the important information um, solve that problem by showing your steps showing your thinking and is there more than one way to solve that problem and and actually it's gotten to the point where it got to the point this year where it did, the answer almost was up, it were not as important as to this process and that shift it took me back it took me to learn how to teach that because it was was not a way that I learned how to do math so through the years I've learned to um, show my steps and show my thinking but now it took it to another level and it was it was a challenge to to learn it myself but it was it was okay to teach the kids but there will be some conflicts with parents who don't have understanding of math or understanding of how to read a problem or how to approach a problem and they won't know how to teach their kids but we still need basic facts and multiplication facts and you know how to well, add and subtract. Well I was going to ask, what happened to the calculator? Are the, well, st kids, are the students uh, allowed to bring their calculator into the class? <laughs> <laughs> well we actually teach them how to use a calculator and how to use the keys um, and how to do math on the computer you know so there, there's still ways that we are still using the technology um, it's just thinking about math differently and and one of the common core pieces is how do you apply it to real life how do, you know your question was are Latino kids able to you know do as well do as well is it believed that they can do as well today we had a conversation around why not wear cap and gown at the fifth grade graduation why 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 can't we wait until college and it was because the statistically Latinos don't make it to high school or college graduation. Therefore, we, we're going to give it to them in the fifth grade. And I told my students, is that what you want? And they said, no, we don't want that. We want to wait until we're in college to wear our cap and gowns. So I said, yes, and I believe that you can. But the statistics show the opposite. So today was a really powerful way to bring math in, to show them percentages, and to show how it applies to real life. And then possibly looking at it another way might be that we should get them used to wearing caps and gowns. Okay, I can see, I can see that argument so as that, well. Yeah, so, so that we are in fact then initiating them to be comfortable in their cap and gown mm -hmm. all the way to judgeship. Okay, <laughs> I'll, I'll bring that up tomorrow to them. Why not? It's a, it sounds like a logical way to do this. Right. Um, so I wanted to also ask you about um, a couple of other things that that I have read that is is turning into what we're calling uh, segregation once again in the school mm -hmm. system mm -hmm. where all of these special schools like Clarendon ha have a thousand um, people trying to get in and then other schools like Cleveland which is 80 percent Latino has no line and no special fares and and what happens with this is it promotion or is it the the uh, parents ability to raise all this extra money at Clarendon or is it uh, branding that's going on with the Unified School District here in San Francisco the word branding for those of you that may not be familiar with it has a lot to do with the publicity and the promotion and, and, and what the parents are doing and clearly the parents at Clarendon are raising extra extra money for extra classes extra ways to tutor children what is going on in the rest of the school system? Well, Paula, you ask a very good question. Um, and as a classroom teacher uh, in public school in the what I call the east side of the mission, in the mission district, that is a quandary. We don't understand what is it that we have some of the most amazing teachers on the east side working really hard and our students aren't progressing as well as we'd like um, and we don't understand how that works why you know I have to say on this show I'm going to say this very publicly that I believe that having a school and that that offers a Spanish dual immersion of a variety of languages changes the demographics of a school. When you have all of the same in one school, it doesn't lift the level of language. It doesn't lift 
the level of being able to reach out to resources that are in our community. We have a rich community and bringing t students from the East and the West together with language being the one that carries us through is a way to cross over to the other side and to really bring the resources of both together. The, what both have to share and to learn from each other. My richest experience with one of my dual immersion classes, it was one of those moments back in, I believe it was Prop 187. Yes, I remember that. Was it was it Prop 187? It was Prop 187 or two, the UNS the initiative, right? Where um, we were, they were trying to go after immigrants, right? Go right. after, and we had that big May Day you know, stop work, paralyze the city. It was, it was very heart wrenching and inspirational at the same time. I had students that were non Spanish speakers and students that were Spanish speakers. And I'll never forget one student, not his real name, Jose. And he cried and said, I, I don't want to be sent back to Mexico. I've been here since I was a baby. And the other child, won't use his name, Sam, said, of not in a non-English, um, non-Spanish speaking student, said, no, that's not fair. They can't do that. I've known Jose since kindergarten, and he needs to stay here. I will fight for him. And I said, this is why dual immersion works. We bring people from opposite sides of the, of the sidewalk of the of the city together and become friends and brothers in the classroom and then remember that when they're making policy when they're making decisions for those underserved students that you speak of they are the ones remembering the Jose's and the Angel's and the Dennis who uh, uh, otherwise don't have a voice right exactly and uh on that same note, then, we are still going to go back to the same question, and that is, busing didn't work. Mm -hmm. So that policy was changed in 2009, and parents were allowed to register their children, enroll their children in the closest school. However, as you know, in San Francisco, our ethnic breakdown has changed dramatically and so that people still live among themselves. Right. So particularly with our Asian community, all clustered, all going to one school, and ending up, I think that the percentage, for example, at Clarendon was something like 30 or 35 percent. Their, their parents drive them to that school. Mm -hmm. But in the rest of the city, what we're ending up with is the same educational system that you and I grew up with mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. in the 50s and 60s, mm -hmm. which is we went to the closest school or the school that we were districted to go into, but not necessarily the best school. Mm -hmm. And so to recognize what's going on in our education, this is why I'm doing this series on educational leaders, because you have been a mentor, a teacher, you've been um, a role model for our students. Mm -hmm. And so we want to hear from you to see what it is that we can do as parents and what is it, it is we can do as aunts and uncles to assist in this educational system, to encourage them to go to Yale and Princeton and, and Renoir and uh, all of the other higher education schools. And then let's talk about technology. What's going right. on with our, our uh, Latinos in the technology field? So it is... It is something that boggles my mind daily cause, because I want my students to have, to, ex, to ex, I want to expose them. I, you know, for all the years that I've been in uh, education, I've taken my students camping out of the area. I've taken them um, to Westminster Woods. I've taken them to Marin Headlands. Why? To expose them, to take them out, to show them a different side of the, this Bay Area. Um, I take them to a lot of field trips. I tell them, look at the uh, look, look what's outside of where we live. You know this enclosure. 
politically, the enclosure has worked for years. You know, I, I feel that it's bigger than the unified school district. It's, it's our policies, our city policies that we need to look at is where are people living? How are they living? Why is it, why is it that we allow the haves and the have nots to be within a city within, you know, you drive, you know, in Petro Hill, um, and it's, you've got poor and rich living next to each other, but separated and the schools, people driving to the schools and yet kids being, you know, t sent over to the baby. I mean, I think we just need to look at systems and structures in our school district, in our city that are going to answer this question that you're asking because it's bigger than you and I sitting here. I mean, I, I, this is something that I worry about myself, that I want our students. They deserve the best. They deserve to go to Yale. They deserve, you know, I, I say to them every year, I ask them, what do you want to be when you grow up? And then they'll say things like a police officer or, you know, et cetera, something like that, or a doctor, a lawyer, the general, you know, the, the usual answers. And I'll say, do you know that who, who was asked that question in third grade? Barack Obama was asked in third grade if he, that what he wanted to be. And he said, I want to be U.S. president. Thank you. And he became the U.S. president. Thank you so very much. if you say <laughs> that, right. you believe it, you will do what you want and e dream big. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of your programs here is also that you uh, work with a scholarship program? Yes. The, the Latin American Teachers Association is the longest uh, nonprofit organization in San Francisco Unified. We provide um, scholarships for underserved students, the undocumented students primarily, who um, don't necessarily have the highest academic um, grades, but they are the kids who've shown, as we call them, the ganas, who maybe were, you know, losing interest in school, having to work two jobs, having to, you know, maybe drop out of school because their parents needed them to help support them, but yet turned it around, found a mentor in the school, in the, in the public schools, and turned it around and became, and wrote an essay saying, I want to become X and I want to do I want to go to engineering school I want to go to become a teacher so all year we teach teachers Latin American teachers and others um, donate our ten dollars it's anywhere from five to twenty five dollars a month we take this money at the end of the year and award about ten scholarships um, to underserved, underserved um, immigrants mostly immigrant students um, and we give them, uh, I think it's $1,500 for two-year college and $3,000 for four-year colleges. We know that it's not enough to give them a full ride, and that's always been my dream as a past president um, of this wonderful nonprofit. But after 17 years of donating my $10 a month, I am very proud that as a Latina, I give back to my community, not only in the classroom, but as well for these students. And I, have a, and I work with a wonderful cadre of volunteers in this nonprofit helping students and every year we help 10 to 12 students stay on the track to get to college. That's really a very very good program. How would uh, one of our viewers contact you to get a hold of you to find out about this particular program? If you want to contact me you can uh, email me at Torres T-O-R-R-E-S L-1 at S-F-U-S-D dot E-D-U or you can reach me at 650-279-9694 is my cell phone number. Thank you. So we want to thank our guests for today and uh, also encourage you to watch the show on Sundays at 3 o'clock p.m. on Channel 29. And you can also log on to YouTube and put in the Paula Fiscal Show, and all of the shows will come up. Again, we want to recognize all of you out there that are teachers, that are working within our school system, that are academic and educational Bay Area leaders. And thank you so much for tuning into our show. <laughs>